Hey there, it's Jason. Welcome to the Jason Wright Show, where the mission is very simple. It is to improve always in all ways. Look, I am on a mission to create the absolute best version of myself. And through the Jason Wright Show, I let you know everything I'm doing to make that happen. I interview incredible, remarkable, brilliant individuals from all different walks of life. And I also try to bring you tools, tactics, and protocols that will help you in your own personal mission to improve always in all ways. Now, let's get started. David Packhouse, thank you so much, brother, for joining us on The Jason Wright Show. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, it's an honor, and I got to tell you, so like we were talking about before I hit record, I your story is, um, it's almost unbelievable. I mean, watching uh, War Dogs, I'm like, this is crazy. And But I don't want this to be just another interview about you retelling this mm-hmm. this movie um and you being the uh one of the main characters or rather the miles teller character is playing you you're the real life guy i will i definitely want to talk about the movie because it's so fascinating the story i mean there, you've got to have just a million stories and kind of go through the what's fact what's fiction what's you know hollywood mm-hmm. drama what's real but more than anything man and i thought this when i watched the movie you and Ifram, I look at you guys as just a couple of hustlers, just entrepreneurs. You're trying to figure mm-hmm. stuff out. And I, I had such great admiration for that, that because I'm one of these guys that I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole life. You know, I had my first business when I was like 13, cutting grass. And then it's funny because I actually started buying and selling guns from a particular pawn shop when I was mm-hmm. about 17. Uh, oh, wow. These guys, they were like, they would go buy all these surplus 357s from a police station in Chicago, bring them down, and mm-hmm. I would buy them for like, I think I paid 175 bucks for them and sold mm-hmm. them for like 225. I thought I was doing, I thought I was big time. You <laughs> go and land a yeah. $300 million freaking contract with, yeah. with the US government. So there's just yeah. so many places we could go with this. But the first thing I want to do is just kind of get to know you and kind of your background growing up. And let's start with the entrepreneurial side, this hustler side of you. Mm-hmm. Where, when did that start? What was your first like real business and kind of just take us from there? Mm-hmm. Well, I started, uh, I started the business hustle uh, quite early. Um, my first business was when I was uh, six years old. Uh, was uh, my dad, uh, it was my dad's suggestion. And the way that happened was, uh, I was uh, living in Israel at the time in Jerusalem, and uh, we were living in a um, in a part old apartment building that didn't have an elevator. It also didn't have a garbage chute, so you'd have to take your trash out uh, down the stairs, uh, out to the corner, to the dumpster on the corner. And um, my mother asked me and my older sister. I was six. My older sister was seven. Uh, she asked us to take the trash out. And we were complaining, you know, because the trash is heavy and took work. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, my dad comes into the kitchen and he sees us complaining to our mother. And our mother's kind of like getting annoyed at us, you know, telling us to stop complaining and take the trash up. And our dad looks at us and he's like, you know, you guys are like looking at this all wrong. This is not this is not a chore. This is an opportunity. And we're like, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know. We live in an apartment building, and I bet you none of our neighbors like taking the trash out either. So if you could go to them and say, hey, I'll take your trash out for a fee. You know, people don't usually take the trash out every day, so you could take it out every other day and charge them maybe a fee per week, like maybe a quarter or something. And uh, we said, huh, that's a pretty good idea. You know, that's uh, we can actually make some money like that. So he's like, okay, great. Now, why don't you practice your new business skills and take your mother's trash out? <laughs> nice. And, and so, so we said, okay, fine. So we took, we took out the trash for our mom. And then we went to all the neighbors in our building and we made them the offer. And we signed up, um, 
six or I don't know, it was like seven or eight neighbors. Uh, and uh, we started taking the trash out. We, we had this big cart, um, this big metal cart on these wheels that uh, we borrowed from our mother. And, um, and uh, we would put the trash in there and, you know, roll the thing down the stairs uh, out to the dumpster. And after a few days of the, after the first week, we told our dad, you know, this is like a lot, a lot of work. It's a very, very backbreaking work. Um, we're not really sure that it's that we really want to do it because it's, it's just it, it's just too much work, not enough money. He's like, well, what if you made double the money? Would you want to do it then? And we're like, well, maybe for double the money, it would be worth it. And he says, well, in that case, why don't you just tell your customers that you raise the price? And now it's twice the price. And we said, but we just were doing this for one week. We can't, can we, we can't just raise the price. We just told them last week it's, it's a quarter. We can't just tell them it's 50 cents. And he's like, well, you know, if you don't tell if you don't raise the price, you're not going to do the work. So they could either pay the new price or you're going to quit anyway. So we said, oh, that's, that's true. And so we told all the neighbors and one neighbor quit. Uh, and from then on, only one out of seven uh, quit. And from then on, we saw their their daughter take the trash out <laughs> <laughs> because I guess they figured, you know, why are we paying the neighbor's kids to take our trash out? We've got a, a perfectly healthy kid of our own. Uh, we've never seen her take the trash out before, but once they quit our service, she, her, her, their daughter took the trash out from then on. And um, and then another neighbor complained about the pr the price hike. He was like in classic Israeli fashion. He's like, uh, he's like, you can't just double the price. This is crazy. Uh, this week you maybe raise it five cents. Ne next week maybe ten cents. Double. This is crazy. What you do? You know. <laughs> and we're like, we just stuck to our guns. We're like, well, this is the new price. And he's like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And he he just paid it with with some grumbling, but he paid it. So. Um, so uh, we we were we did this for another few weeks, and then after that, my sister decided that she uh, it was too much work for her, and uh, and she didn't want to do it anymore. And I realized, hey, you know, I just got a, a, a another doubling of my salary. So so I kept on doing it for another few months, and I built up quite a bit of quarters. Uh, would keep it in a little Ziploc bag in my parents' room. And uh, every day the uh, ice cream truck would come around with this little ice cream song. And as a six-year-old, I'd think to myself, I've got money. I could buy myself an ice cream. And uh, my parents would never buy me ice cream. So this was like a special thing. And I'd go out there and buy myself a little ice cream. And it got to the point where I remember I had a, uh, uh, I would pretty much buy myself an ice cream every day from my, from my earnings. And it got to the point where my my aunt came visiting from the United States. My parents are Americans, so our family, um, you know, it's based mostly in America. Uh, my aunt came from the United States, and she looked at me, and she's like, "Huh, you're gaining a little bit of weight." <laughs> 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 I guess all, all that ice cream, uh, uh, to, you know, it, it started to affect my six-year-old self. And uh, the way that that business eventually ended was, um, my brother asked, "I got a, a, a birthday gift." Uh, uh, from my dad, uh, when I turned seven, of this little toy airplane had this like little um, uh, propeller where you with like powered by a rubber band where you wind it up and then you throw it and it flies for a little bit. And it was made out of styrofoam. And my older brother, who was three years older than me, so he was ten, he asked me to play with it. And I said, "Sure, you could play with it, but if you break it, you have to pay for a new one." And he said, absolutely. And our father was right there. And he's like, our father, you know, will be my witness that I, I commit to paying for it if I break it. And of course, on the first throw, it shattered and he broke it. <laughs> but of course, he had, he had no way to pay me back. So our dad suggested that he take over my, uh, my garbage collecting business to pay me back. And it took him like a good month to earn enough money to pay, to pay back for that airplane. And at that point, I was already used to not doing the work. And uh, I had already a whole bunch of quarters saved up, so I, I could still buy my ice cream without uh, getting back to work, and <laughs> so I let the business die. But uh, but yeah, that was my first uh, entrepreneurial venture as a six year old. It was all about the ice cream. <laughs> you know, that's it's it's funny because um, I taught one of my daughters, my youngest Abby, who's probably of the two girls. Both girls are hard workers, but Abby's mm -hmm. always been kind of the mm -hmm. the entrepreneur of the two, mm -hmm. and so I owned a real estate firm. 
and I let her set up a snack cell at mm-hmm. the in the in the kitchen of the the office I owned here, and um, it meant she learned more. Like I, I was her venture capitalist. I said, okay, I will loan you the money for mm-hmm. the inventory. I'm going to show you. Here's how you price your candy bars and your chips mm-hmm. and stuff. And she was about six years old, about the same age. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she learned more from that little experience that she carried with her. And there's something about being a young child and just understanding the respect for like the airplane I- issues, mm-hmm. learn- learning how to appreciate money and realizing mm-hmm. that, huh, there are things that I can do that people will exchange money for. I think, and I don't think enough people do that these days. So, so that's really cool. So what took yeah, you guys agreed. to Israel? Was your, was your dad's job or what? And what was yeah, it like, like living in Israel? Uh, my dad was a rabbi. So, okay. yeah, so he went there for work. Um, he worked for a big Jewish educational organization and, and uh, they were based in Israel. And so that's why we were kind of like back and forth. Um, and yeah, Israel, I grew up in Jerusalem. I was born in the United States, but lived in Jerusalem uh, uh, from when I was a baby until I was about eight years old. And then we moved to Miami. Uh, Israel is a very interesting place. It's um, got a lot of history, a lot of diverse types of people, a lot of tension in the air. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, want to live there full time myself these days, but uh, I do have a lot of family that still lives there. And uh, so my mom still lives there and, and uh, half of my siblings still live there too. I'm, I'm one of nine children just. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, some wow. Context. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, all right. So then, how old are you whenever you come back to the states? I was eight years old when okay. We moved so, to Miami. so, so two years after your first uh, big uh, trash hauling yeah. enterprise. Um, yes, exactly. And so, when does um, Ephraim come into your life? I got to ask that. Yeah. So I met Ephraim. Uh, for those who don't know, he's the character played by Jonah Hill in the War Dogs movie. Um, I met him when i was about 16 years old uh and he he's four years younger than me so he was about 12 and uh he i i grew up in an orthodox jewish uh family and so did he we were part of the same community so uh our families went to the same synagogue uh I, we didn't go to the same school though we both went to orthodox jewish schools uh, but he, but since we went to the same synagogue and neither of us particularly liked to pray we would sneak out of the synagogue during prayers and hang out on the basketball courts. And uh, I had I was hanging out with friends of mine who were about two years younger than me, and they were friends with him. And so that's kind of how he uh, came into my social circle, so to speak. Okay, so so that's how you guys meet. But then I know he goes off. And and by the way, I'm going to set all this up for the listener. We're gonna I'm actually going to show. Mm-hmm. And for those of you listening, you'll hear a trailer of the movie, and then we'll mm-hmm. kind of talk through some stuff like that. But I'm just want to kind of kind of put the timeline together here because I know that he mm-hmm. goes off, you guys part. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens, like you enter adulthood and then you start working and kind of take us to what you're doing leading up to Ephraim coming back into your life mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden the craziest be- ve- adventure, I got to believe, of your life ensues. <laughs> so kind of yeah. what what does that look like up during that time between you know you guys going to school together and then all of a sudden him coming back? What are you doing at that point? Sure. So, um, I went after high school, I went to Israel for two years, uh, to study. My parents wanted me to become more religious, uh, didn't work, but, uh, but I had a good time in Israel and, uh, came back to the United States, uh, went to university. Um, I was studying chemistry. I also, uh, got a massage therapy license cause I realized that, uh, I, it was, a uh, I could make in doing in one hour, uh, you know, doing a massage, I could make more than all my friends were making an entire day working at like a, you know, a restaurant or at a, at a store or something, you know, doing minimum wage work. So, uh, and of course, you know, the girls always like to hear that you're a a licensed (laughs) massage therapist. So that, that definitely helped. Um, I would also started a few online businesses. I, at the time, digital cameras were getting to be really big. And, uh, you needed an SD card. So I bought a, I was looking for, uh, a high capacity SD card and, uh, it turned out that those were kind of expensive. So I kept on looking for better deals online and eventually 
uh, came across companies in China who were selling them in bulk for a lot cheaper. And so I bought a whole bunch of them and started selling them on eBay and uh, started making a decent amount of money doing that. Uh, SD cards are a great business because it doesn't take up much room. They're easy to ship. Um, and I, and so while I was doing that, a friend of mine who his dad, um, owned a nursing home and his dad was getting him into the business of supplying nursing homes, not just his own, but his, uh, other nursing homes in the industry. So he had heard about me, uh, doing this SD card business. And he's like, Hey, you know, it looks like you you know how to, uh, find sources overseas and, and, um, and, uh, uh, you know, bring them in. So if you, I'm actually doing this, this, uh, this, uh, nursing home distribution, uh, supply business. So if you can find, uh, better, uh, prices overseas for these items, it was mostly like bed sheets and towels and, um, uh, and patient gowns and things like that, that nursing homes use. He's like, I'm happy to buy from you rather than the distributors. And so I looked online and uh did a whole bunch of research and eventually found uh better prices for him than he was getting and so i started uh supplying uh, nursing homes not just him but some other um, distributors as well so i was importing uh containers of of uh, bed sheets and towels um when that that little bit makes it into the movie though of mm -hmm. course they change they change it uh i was just importing uh containers and shipping them directly to distributors i was not uh, going from nursing home to nursing home directly with, uh, samples or anything like that. Uh, but of course they, they needed to make, make my life a lot, look a lot harder in the movie. So there's a bigger difference when, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, Ephraim makes me the offer to join him in business. So, um, anyway, uh, so I was doing these things and then I bump into Ephraim at a mutual friend's house. I hadn't seen him in like a few years. Uh, he had been uh when he was 16 he was kicked out of uh the, the private jewish religious school that he had been going to uh because he'd been caught smoking weed and uh his parents said well you know if you're not serious about uh taking the rules of the school seriously we're going to put you out into the real world and you're going to go work for your uncle and his uncle who was based in la um had this a uh, big pawn shop in south central la and one of the things his uncle did was he would sell uh, supplies to the local and state police. Uh, he would sell handguns, uh, bulletproof vests, things like that. And so Ephraim got obsessed with guns. He became like a, a total gun guy, as they call it, you know, like someone who's just obsessed with guns, knows everything about guns. And he was buying and selling used guns on the gun boards online. And so he got to know the, the market really well. For, he did this for a couple of years. He learned how to bid on government contracts with his uncle. And then after about two years working with his uncle, when he was 18, he claims his uncle screwed him out of a whole bunch of money. His uncle claims that he screwed him out of a whole bunch of money. I believe both of them. They're both scumbags, you know? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, Ephraim decides to leave and come back to Miami and uh start his own his his dad already had this company the aey that he wasn't using for anything he had started it he had started it a few years before to use as like a label printing business so he took over that company and registered it with the federal government and started bidding on federal contracts and uh this was in 2005 so this was uh, 2004 2005 and so this was right after the invasion of uh iraq uh where um the united states had gone in and destroyed Saddam Hussein. And then the idea was that, that we we're going to build up a democratic government there. And the U S government was pretty much footing the bill for, for all of that. So part of building up a democratic government was building up their police force and their military. And so the United States was buying all the equipment to do that. And so there is just massive amounts of, uh, things that the, that the United States was looking to buy and send to Iraq. And he started winning a whole bunch of contracts. After about a year of working on his own, we bumped into each other and, uh, he asked me what I was doing that, you know, these days. And I told him about my SD card business and my bed sheets and linens business that I was doing importing and, and all that. And he's like, huh, you know, that's actually really similar to a lot of the stuff I do. 
looking for suppliers overseas, arranging logistics, dealing with licensing, negotiating, you know, all those things. That's pretty much all the stuff I'm doing, but I bet you I'm making way more money than you. So maybe, you know, maybe you should join me in business. I could actually use a partner. You know, I could use someone who I trust. I know known you for most of our lives. And, uh, you know, I know you're a hard worker, smart guy. So if, you know, maybe we could be, uh, you know, you could join me in my business and we could make even more money together. And I told him, well, uh, how much money you've been making? And, and he's like, well, I'm going to tell you, but only to inspire you. I'm not showing off here. Okay. Right. So he opens up his laptop and he logs in to his bank account and he shows me his bank account and he had $1.8 million in the bank in cash. And he was 18 years old at the time. Oh my and, God. And I was like, holy crap. He's been working for less than a year on his own by himself. Uh, you know, I knew, I knew, I know his family, so I know his parents didn't give him that money or anything. I knew he earned it. Um, I was like, well, this guy obviously knows how to make a lot of money in a business and, uh, he's doing a lot better than me. That's for sure. I mean, I wasn't doing badly, but I definitely wasn't in the millions of dollars range. So I thought, well, this is a huge opportunity. He knows something I don't, that's for sure. And so I said, okay, I'm in, you know, teach me what you know. I'm, I'll, uh, I'll do this. And so he started teaching me how um, all the uh, federal contracting system works and about guns and which I didn't, I, I've never been a gun guy or anything like that. So I was not, oh, <clears throat> not, not educated at all in the gun business. Uh, so he started teaching me about that and, and about how to uh, bid on contracts with the federal government and, and all the licensing that's required for these kinds of contracts and these kind of items and all that. And, uh, and that's how I got into it. Wow. All right. And so, which makes for a perfect setup. So for yeah. the listeners, I'm going to play the trailer and, and you can go back and watch it on the YouTube channel for those of you watching. I want to tee this up and let's just, uh, let's just see what, what that, that was the seed that was planted for what would eventually become this. Get this here. Frankly, we were a tad concerned with your performance history against a deal of this size. But after meeting you two face to face, we feel like we're in good hands on this one. We won't let you down. Sirs. Not to mention the bid was far too attractive for us to pass up. What did you mean by that exactly? He means you boys lowballed the entire industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, by how much? You guys came in $53 million lower than the nearest competition. Now, I got to ask, is that, is that accurate? That is accurate. <laughs> so, what do you, so you guys yeah. are just sitting there going, yeah. you'd seen 1.8. That would have blown yeah. my mind. And yeah. you're hearing, oh my God, we left $53 million on the table? Yeah, yeah. That, so it didn't, it, so that number is accurate, but it, the, where we found out about it was not, in like this it wasn't like in a big meeting with the pentagon that, that's more dramatic to make it like that in the movie uh no it's actually illegal for them to tell us that <laughs> they were not okay. allowed to tell us yeah how much how much money we uh we came in under the next bidder um yeah, the government keeps bids secret because that that way sure. everyone's uh, maximally competitive and gives the best price to the government in theory um, so, uh, the way we found out, I, I was actually talking to one of the contracting officers from the army on the phone and we were, you know, we, we had, we work a lot together because it was a very big contract. So we had gotten pretty friendly and he, he made some joke. He's like, yeah, I mean, you guys, you guys really kicked ass there in the bidding. And I was like, oh really? Uh, you know, how, how, how well did we do? And he's like, he's like, listen, you know, this is off the record. I can't really tell you this, but <laughs> oh my you guys God. came in 53 million under the next lowest bidder and and you know all the major uh fortune 500 companies like atk systems general dynamics they were way over i mean they're like the multi-billion dollar companies who we were competing against and who we beat um they were like like 100 to 200 million more than us oh so we were like almost like like 50 percent lower than than some of the major competitors uh so yeah it was, oh. it, we, we had beaten them by quite a lot. So, but were you really in meetings like this? Was it like a formal meeting like this? You two, you two knuckleheads sitting at, a, at yeah. the end of a so, table with these supposed, you know, government leaders? 
So this meeting did happen. Uh, okay. The, uh, it, it wasn't at the Pentagon. It was at Rock Island Arsenal, uh, which is in Illinois. Um, that's where a lot of the contracting is is uh, done out of, um, you know, uh, I should say, administered by the U.S. Go- by the U by the Army. Okay. And um, uh, I was not at that meeting because Ephraim. So before they awarded us the three hundred million dollar contract, they asked us to come to a meeting. Uh, I guess they wanted to see us face to face before they did such a big. They awarded us such a big contract. And Ephraim, who's four years younger than me. Uh, he obviously wanted to go to the, you know, he, he's the president of the company, so he had to go to the meeting, but he felt like we needed someone who was, a uh, he was 21 years old at the time, I think. Yeah, he was 21. So he, um, uh, he felt like he needed someone who was a little bit older and more respectable looking than me. Um, and so we, uh, so he decided to bring, uh, Ralph. Uh, Ralph Merrill, who in the movie is played by the older Jew who owns the uh, the uh, uh, the laundry right. uh, uh, the, la- the the laundromats, and uh, and he's our investor. And in real life, he was our investor, but he was not a Jew and he didn't own laundromats. His name was Ralph, uh, but he was actually a Mormon who owned a machine gun factory. Oh wow! And yeah, so he's a, a little bit more relevant. He's actually how we got in contact. With uh, with Heinrich Tomei, who's the guy played by Bradley Cooper, uh, he introduced us to him. So that's how we got that contact, which is also a little different than how they show in the movie. But uh, yeah, so Ephraim took Ralph to that meeting in Rock Island Arsenal and did have a meeting like this with with all the contracting officers over there. That's crazy. Okay, let's keep this going. Yeah. And Jonah Hill just. Okay. I don't know how much Ephraim's really like Jonah Hill, but Jonah yeah. Hill, I love this him in this role. Yeah. Right. yeah. Now yeah. a question that still has no clear answer. How did two 20-something young men land a $300 million Pentagon contract? I have a big idea. Hey. You got you both got. They call guys like us war dogs. Bottom feeders who make money off of war without ever stepping foot on the battlefield. So you both... Hey. It was meant to be derogatory, but we kind of liked it. Go play fit. Sorry, Excuse kind me. of an emergency. Sorry, don't worry. I have to go first. I'm American. <laughs> Which I gotta say, I love that. I don't know yeah. if that was. That's just such a a perfect line going through an airport. All right. So one yeah. of the things, though, right here for those of you who aren't watching this, yeah. uh, which is listening, you guys are. It looks like you're in the Middle East mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah. So were you making trips over for uh, to the Middle East in these kind of these war zones and having to negotiate some of these deals? So we did do a lot of traveling and, uh, I've been to the, I mean, I grew up in Israel, so I know a little bit of the Middle East, but, um, uh, but most of the things we were doing were not in war zones. So, uh, we were much more on the business side. Uh, so we would go to, uh, to, um, uh, to exhibitions, uh, and, you know, trade shows. Yep. So we've been to trade shows like in Paris, um, India, South Africa, uh, you know, around the world, but not actually in in war zone. Okay. So this, so this, um, uh, I will say just just to go back a little bit to what you said before, uh, Jonah Hill in the movie is actually a much more um, toned down version of Ephraim. Oh dear Lord. Yeah. God yeah, bless you, yeah. brother, for having to yeah. go with a partner like that then. Oh, he was insane. Like, like he was really, really crazy. Um, they actually, so I talked to the, to the screenwriter who was writing the, the script for War Dogs. And uh, he told me, you know, after I told him all our stories and everything, he's like, look, you know, if I write Ephraim the way Ephraim really is, he's not going to be, it's not believable. <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> He's like, I need to, I need to tone him down to make him more believable and to make him more likable because he was kind of, he was, I mean, I, I haven't talked to him in quite a, a whole bunch of years, but he was quite a, um, quite a sociopath. Uh, and just like, uh, not, not someone that you really wanted to like hang around once you like got to know him. So yeah, he, he, wa- he had to tone him down to make him more likable so that the audience would, bond with them a little bit more. That was 
And whenever you're going through that, all right, so how are you dealing with this? Was it just because you had to yeah. make a Now, at this point, are you married at this point when you start this? Or I can't, I, honestly, I can't remember mm -hmm. when you, whenever you get married and then you guys have a child, I think your first child. Yeah. When, when does that happen in the midst yeah. of this? So my, my daughter was born, uh, actually just a few weeks after we won this, the big contract, the $300 okay. million dollar contract. Okay. So, so yeah. So in the lead up to this, uh, when we were trying to win it, um, my daughter was on the way. So, so are, are you, that's, that, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. So are you just kind of under the pressure? Yeah. So you're willing to tolerate yes. that from? Got it. Exactly. I was under a huge amount of pressure, uh, because this was, you know, I, I realized I had to support a kid, uh, that was coming very soon. And, um, and, uh, I had, I was all in on this. And so, yeah, I, I, guess that 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 um that probably uh influenced some of my decision making that to take bigger risks than i should have yeah okay well, let's let's yeah. keep this going a little bit yeah you seriously want to drive to back david we're gun runners Let's go run some guns. Hit me some. <laughs> All right. So now I did watch a little an interview you did earlier. So you guys yeah. actually didn't go through the triangle of death, right? That's true. To, okay. to everyone's great disappointment. Yeah, because I'm. Grow. I mean, I was like, dude, yeah. that was insane. Yeah. So, so kind of, yeah. how did that? What, what was the reality yeah. there? Yeah. So that story is based on a true story. It's just not our story. Got so, um, while. It, that story is actually based on something that happened to the screenwriter Stephen Chin. So he um, he so the reason he got the contract to write the War Dog script is because he had written another script uh, called Iraq Iraq, um, which was based on these uh, other two American guys who were in Iraq at the time of, that this was happening. And he to write that script, he wanted to go into Iraq to meet them but of course he couldn't get a commercial uh ticket to iraq so he flew to jordan and hired a jordanian driver to drive him into iraq to baghdad and uh and he got shot at by insurgents and got saved by the u.s army just like it shows in the movie oh. so that that actually did happen to him uh they did stop at fallujah to get gas because it was free <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and so while he was writing the script, uh, Todd Phillips, who's the director of mm -hmm. War Dogs, um, he told Steven, he's like, Hey, you know, there's just too much, uh, too much time of these guys just sitting in, in the office in front of computers. We need some action in this movie. Why don't you put your story where you went to Iraq into there? And, and so uh, the, the Beretta deal, it was a real deal that, you know, that is based on truth, but in reality, we actually defaulted on that deal. We didn't. Uh, deliver that deal uh, like they show in the movie. Um, so, so yeah, so they changed that in order to put up uh, more action. And isn't that kind of insane that like, I mean, I mean, I hate it because I'm a, I'm a, you know, uh, I, I'm, I love America. I'm a, the most patriotic guy in the world. And I love the mm -hmm. fact that we have the, the world's greatest uh, military, but dude, the fact mm -hmm. that again, that this is truly how some of our weapons were sourced. I mean, and it, are there other, mm -hmm. War dogs, I get y'all aren't the only ones. I mean, is, this is like, sure. is it still going on? Is it still prevalent? There's still somewhere out there just kind of these small shops bidding on these contracts and selling massive amounts of arms to different uh, organizations. Is that still happening? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's still how it works. Um, <laughs> that's crazy. You know, there's, it's, uh, I mean, it's not just arms, it's everything. Yeah. Uh, we were, my first contract was uh, for 50,000 gallons of propane. And, uh, yeah, it was just totally random and you could make but there. I, so actually interesting that, um, uh, a little while ago I was contacted by these two guys who, uh, out of the blue and they told me that they were super inspired by war dogs to learn how to do government contracting. Just, oh, I went on after I watched was, the movie the first time I yeah. did the same thing, David, I went on there. It, I was like, holy crap, this is real. And yeah, I actually was a partner yeah. in a. In the infrastructure company, I'm like, mm -hmm. I told my partner, I'm like, Russell, do you realize that these contracts are out here? And he said, Oh yeah, they're they're yeah. there. I mean, it's it's um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, 
So these guys, these two guys, uh, they got really inspired by the movie and uh, they got obsessive about it and they, they learned how to do government contracting and they built a multi-million dollar business supplying laundry services to the government. Just totally really? random. Not that they had any background in laundry, it was just happened to be the contract that they happened to win and then they built a reputation in that industry and were able to win further contracts. And so they built a whole multi-million dollar business providing laundry services to the government. Um, and so now actually we are working, so they had, uh, they had an idea, Hey, you know, if we could learn how to do it, we could teach other people how to do it as well. So, uh, we are currently working together on, uh, what we are calling uh, war dogs university nice. to uh, teach people how to do government contracting. It's not out yet, but, uh, anyone who is interested in eventually, uh, uh, being a part of that, you could follow me on social media and I'll make an announcement when it's ready. I have got to connect you with, are you familiar with uh, James Altucher? Do you know who that is? I don't offhand, no. Oh man, okay. So James Altucher, he's he's actually the host of my favorite podcast, multiple mm -hmm. New York Times bestselling author. I mean, just a, mm -hmm. the most badass kind of like um, Yoda mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs there is out there. I, I just, I love James. And he, first of all, he would be an you'd be an incredible guest on his show. He's a much better interviewer mm -hmm. than I am, and he's just <laughs> it, it, he's just he's just he's he's amazing. And he's also he loves he would love this story. And with you starting mm -hmm. that business, James, mm -hmm. I know would probably just clean it. And, and he would give you infinite ideas on how to make that just blow up. And awesome. so so I'm gonna so I hold me to that. I want to try to connect you guys. His uh, his producer Jay Yao and I are. Uh, our buddies and Jay's just mm -hmm. an awesome guy. So Jay, if you listen to this, uh, I need you to help me out to get David and James connected. So, all right. Well, sure. so, so let's, uh, all right, I want to finish out this trailer and just see if there's anything else I want to ask you about. Wait, sir, come on, man. You drove these. Through the triangle of death. It did make for good film, dude. Yeah. <laughs> the triangle of death, bro. <laughs> all right, so I right, I'll, I'll get back over here. All right, so there had to have been yeah. some moments where you were just going, "What the? What has my life become? How <laughs> I, I used to deliver trash for I used to take trash yeah. out for a quarter of bag yeah. and buy ice cream in Israel, yeah. and now I'm a gun runner. Yeah, D did was it? Were you so in the moment that it's just okay? This became life, or was it constantly uh, uh, waking up in a sweat? I mean, just kind of paint the picture of what your life is like while this is going on. Uh, well, it was extremely hard work. So. Um, one thing I'll, I'll give to, uh, uh, to Ephraim, uh, though, obviously we did, we're not friends anymore and, uh, he stole many millions of dollars from me, um, mm -hmm. is that, and he's screwed over many other people in his, uh, business career too. Um, is he still in jail by the way? No, no, he's, he's out. out. He's okay. out. He's out and about, uh, getting into lawsuits with people. You know, that's, oh, wow. that's the, the, all I hear about him these days is who, who's suing him and who he's suing. So that seems to be his uh, business now. Um, but he also stole millions of dollars from Ralph, the, the guy who uh, was, you know, the mm -hmm. investor who he had taken to that meeting and, and who had introduced him to Henry and, and, and many other people. I mean, that seems to be his pattern. You know, he gets into business with someone and it always ends in tears. So I was, it wasn't just me. Um, but um, one thing I'll give him is that he was a obsessive workaholic mm -hmm. and to an unhealthy degree. I mean, we would work and when I would work with him, uh, I picked up his habits and his work style. Uh, and so we would work like 18 hour days, like consistently for months on end, uh, just obsessive. Like we'd wake up in the, I'd like stay over his house. I'd fall asleep on his couch. I'd wake up. And as soon as I'd wake up, we'd back to looking at the government website, calling people, trying to uh, do deals. And, and just like all day, like he, like during meal times, he would take calls on the toilet. He would take calls like while having sex with his girlfriend. Like <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm like not even kidding. Oh he would God. brag about it. He loved, he loved bragging about that. He, he, he would, he'd love to say, it's like, yeah, I was just, you know, 
getting a blowjob from my girlfriend. And then I got a call from the, uh, from the contracting officer in Iraq. And I said, don't stop, baby. This is important. This is important. Okay. This is business. You, you keep on doing that. And, and of course she hates it, but you know, oh but she my. knows what side, what side her bread is buttered on. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah. 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 He, he would do that. And, uh, I think it, he, yeah, you know, he got off on it, but, um, but yeah, I mean, he just, that's just to say that he was a, a true workaholic obsessive and it was extremely stressful. And, um, so that, so my life at the time was just a never ending, uh, uh, a constant, uh, emergency from one thing to another. Every, something was always going wrong. There was always something that needed to be done now, 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 or yesterday. Uh, so it was just like nonstop stress. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, I would say that the, the, um, uh, the first, the first thing that the first moment that where I was like, what, what the hell am I getting myself into? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of moment, uh, was about a month or so one or two months into working with him, he got, uh, we were working on separate things. We weren't like all both working on the same thing because like the, his idea was that I would, uh, uh, our deal was that I would, uh, work on contracts and pretty much do all the work up to the point where it was ready to be submitted to the government. And then he would help, uh, take all the bids and, and fill out the government paperwork and do some last minute negotiating with all the suppliers, which he was very good at. He's a very good negotiator and, um, and then, you know, fund the deal and help, uh, uh, you know, do post-contract negotiations and, and, uh, so that we would squeeze the most money out of it. And, um, uh, and of course, put everything under his company name. So, uh, but I would do almost all the work beforehand. So, uh, uh, while we were, we were each working on our own things and I, but I worked right next to him, we were working out of his apartment in his living room and he had a big desk filled with papers in his living room. And, uh, so I saw that he, you know, I heard him talking that he was working on this deal to supply the King of Nepal with uh, heavy equipment. So ne the king of Nepal at the time was facing down a, uh, a pro-democracy uh, protest and the, uh, he was trying to suppress this, this movement. And so Ephraim, through some of his connections, uh, got a request to supply the king of Nepal with uh, attack helicopters and heavy machine guns and riot control gear and, and things of that nature that was meant to put down this movement. And he was working his ass off to get these things over to the king of Nepal. Of Nepal. And I told him, like, Ephraim, this kind of like, you know, kind of messed up, you know, that you're, you're trying to keep, he, he called it, he would, he would laugh. He's like, oh, I'm working on the save the king package. <laughs> and I said, that's kind of, kind of messed up. You know, I mean, we're like, you know, uh, you know, I think we're Americans. We uh, believe in democracy and you're trying to save the king and help him oppress his people. And that's kind of pretty pretty messed up and i'm pretty sure that's illegal too you know um and he's and he goes to me listen bro just you work on your fuel contract i was working on fuel, you know i told mm -hmm. you my first my first contract was for fifty thousand gallons of propane he's like you just work you worry about your fuel contracts and let me deal with the king all right i'll, I'll take care of the king right so real and, quick i, I want to ask yeah. you about that so that was a, that was yeah. that's a curiosity i had so yeah. whenever you guys were doing a deal a gun deal did you always, did you take into consideration, I mean, like this, at this point, you would kind of yeah. know the end user. So it wasn't kind of like a uh, James Bond Casino Royale where they're, where they're laundering money for warlords or you guys, or like mm -hmm. even the other, the only other gun running movie that I really know, the Lord of War, you know, about the yeah. merchant of death, where you don't care who you're selling to, you're just dealing guns. It sounds like Ephraim was willing to do that, but you were trying right. to, and this is why I think it's important for the audience to know, it sounds like in the movie makes it like you guys are just kind of on the edge of legality because that kind of makes mm -hmm. it more of kind of like a i don't know more exciting but really you guys were operating within the boundaries for the yeah. longest until this and i'll let you describe it at the end you know where there's a technicality on where the ammunition comes from that your son's in the military that that's kind of what blew the thing up on the 300 million dollar contract but like right. but but you guys always knew who the end user was and y'all would have those kind of conversations about yeah we shouldn't help this these people right is that what is that yeah. what i'm understanding so the way the way international arms deals work is that 
legally you are required to uh, to obtain uh, a end user certificate or EUC they call it, and that is a official document from the end user from the from the uh, people organization that is actually going to be using this equipment. You know, in our case with the three hundred million dollar contract from the um, Afghan National Army and police. So they would have to give an official stamp and a document uh, that they are that they are going to be the ones using this equipment, and they they uh, commit to not selling or giving this equipment to anyone else without the suppliers, the original supplier's permission. And that's how uh, international arms are attempted to be controlled of who gets it. Uh, if you don't have this end user, you end user certificate, that is an, an illegal arms deal. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that deal. And usually almost all com uh, countries uh, require that you provide this end user, end user certificate uh, in order to, in order for the supplying country to, to provide a, an export permit, which without which you are not allowed to export the uh, items from that country. So for them to allow the, the exit of the stuff, you need to give them then the EUC. Uh, so you, now you could fake it, right? There are, uh, criminals who fake these documents, sure. uh, and that's one way that, that it's done, but if for it to be legal, obviously you need these documents and you need to see who it's for. And as American citizens, additionally, you are required to have a broker's license from the state department. Um, and you have to register every individual deal with the state department so that they know what is moving to who, from who, and to who. Um, and uh, they have to give their stamp of approval before you actually do that deal. So uh, his deal with Nepal, not, I mean, it ended up falling through as he was very disappointed. He said, he told me he, yeah, uh, that uh, unfortunately peace broke out. And so the deal fell through. Uh, <laughs> peace broke out. <laughs> yeah, peace broke out. That was wow. the way he put it. Um, so, um, you know, nothing worse for business than peace breaking out. And, um, and so that deal never ended up going through, but if he had done that deal, uh, I mean, I never actually looked into it, but I am 99% sure that that would have been denied by the state department as far as, uh, uh, uh deals that would have been allowed to, uh, to go through. So, uh, if he had done that deal, that would have been a completely illegal deal that he could have gotten into a huge amount of trouble for but um he obviously had an extremely high risk tolerance and was willing to work on it all right i gotta ask you are there some war yeah. dogs right now just getting rich off ukraine oh for sure absolutely yeah. i mean i gotta believe it yeah oh yeah i mean there's anytime there's large amounts of money being moved someone's getting rich right and it's not necessarily it, it, it's not necessarily everybody i mean there's the United States is giving Ukraine lots of stuff for free. Uh, so uh, in that case, those kind of deals, probably people aren't getting rich because it's just government to government transfers. Uh, but there's a lot more stuff that's going on besides that. So Ukraine is in a massive, one of the biggest war since uh, ground war since World War II, which mm -hmm. chews up massive amounts of equipment and ammo and weapons and, and everything. And uh, I mean, there, recently Ukraine uh, just fired their defense mis minister and specifically because there were some allegations of corruption within the defense department of Ukraine. And so, and, and Ukraine has a long history of uh, problems with corruption. That's something that they've been struggling with for a very long time, as all do, as do all the um, former Soviet republics, the Soviet Union, uh, it could be argued, uh, collapsed because of endemic corruption. Uh, so, so all their former Soviet satellites have that cultural baggage, um, a, including Ukraine, which they're working very hard to address. I mean, they're not going to be led into, into NATO and into the EU unless they are, unless they solve their corruption problems. So they have, uh, very significant, um, uh, incentives to fix their corruption issues, but for sure things are happening there for sure. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I got to believe that someone that is high up in the government in Ukraine mm -hmm. 
obviously the end user agreements are going to get signed by the State Department, mm-hmm. everybody to sell to Ukraine. But once it's in Ukraine and there's some dude that has access to the weapons that can then sell them wherever, mm-hmm. I just, you can, and, and then there's really, mm-hmm. I mean, we like to think that there's a way for the State Department or the United States to keep a track, mm-hmm. you know, keep a, you know, kind of a paper trail or whatever. Mm-hmm. But once it gets mm-hmm. over, like, it's kind of like the whole deal with Afghanistan where you would hear about mm-hmm. the, the airplane hangers with pallets of cash right. one day and then literally with that night gone and nobody knows sure. where it went. Sure. That's just, it's just, that's one of the things that was so fascinating about the movie and the story that you guys were the subject of was just that it, there's just, this is going on all the time. It, it's just, mm-hmm. it, it, it's just kind of mind blowing that, oh my gosh, this is real. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, there's massive amounts of money, and anytime there's massive amounts of money moving around, there's always some level of oh, corruption, yeah. and uh, that's why there the United States has uh, law enforcement agencies uh, dedicated to uh, catching people who who engage in these things because otherwise, there very little of the money would actually go where it needs to go, and the whole system would collapse because it's just not running efficient. So now let's get to. What finally brought you guys down? You you, mm. you inked the three hundred million dollar contract, right? This is the one that yeah. with the, the problems were in, right? The big one. Yeah, correct. So you ink this, and I got to believe if I'm you, I'm thinking, wow, I, I've just retired myself if I decide to. Yeah. What a great feeling yeah. that is. Yeah, and yeah. you've gone through the stress of a baby girl on the way, and all this, and mm-hmm. now you're like, okay, dealing with Ephraim and all his nonsense, it's about mm-hmm. to pay off. But then it comes crashing down. Why? What happened? So we so. The, the $300 million contract was for munitions and uh, it wasn't for weapons themselves. It was for all the munitions that went in the weapons. It was, and it was everything, was, I think something like 30 different items, like everything from pistol ammo all the way up to anti-aircraft rockets and mortar rounds and tank shells. So it was a huge amount of stuff. Um, and uh, and uh, some of the stuff we were, we were supplying was the ammunition for the AK-47, the standard assault rifle. Uh, of the Warsaw Pact, which is what the Afghans used, um, and the ammunition that we that we sourced for this, uh, we found uh, through our uh, connection with uh, Henry Tomei, uh, who's the guy played by Bradley Cooper in the movie. Uh, we found a huge supply in Albania for very very cheap, and when we sent someone to inspect it, um, we found out why it was so cheap. <laughs> Because uh, unbeknownst to us at the time, until we inspected it, um, it had originally come from China. And uh, because Albania had been in uh, alliance with China during the Cold War, and so they got a whole bunch of military equipment from China for free. Um, And of course, the war never, the hot war never came. And so that they had all this ammo uh, and various other military equipment just lying around collecting dust. Albania wanted to join NATO. And so, therefore, one of NATO's rules was that you have to get rid of all your old Warsaw Pact ammo and, and weapons. So they were had they had to pay to get it destroyed, and so they were thrilled to sell it for anything because it saves the money from having to pay for it to be destroyed, and they also make money on the sale. So they so we got a really good deal on it. Then we discover it originally comes from China, which uh, uh, our contract with the U.S. Army specifically said no Chinese ammunition could be delivered either directly or indirectly. And the reason they put that in there was because there's uh, currently, ever since 1989, there's an arms embargo against China. Um, in, the, in 1989, there was a, the Tiananmen Square massacre, mm-hmm. which uh, the, there was a big uh, pro-democracy protest movement in Beijing. Um, and the, you know, by a bunch of like thousands of college students in the main square of the city uh, called Tiananmen Square. And uh, the Chinese government uh, rolled in tanks and pretty much killed everybody or killed hundreds, if not thousands of people just in a huge massacre. And this was done on like live TV. So it was something that the whole world saw and became a huge political uh, thing. And uh, to punish the, the Chinese government and army for doing that, the U.S. put uh, China on an arms embargo list so it was illegal so it's still currently illegal for u.s uh citizens and companies to um to buy or sell military equipment with chinese companies 
So because of that, they put this uh, requirement on our contract that we can't, couldn't supply any Chinese ammo. Now, the thing is, is that it, our contract did not say you can't supply Chinese ammo that violates the embargo. It, they just said you can't supply Chinese ammo for this contract. And if you had bought Chinese ammo or weapons in 1988 while it was legal and imported it into the United States, that ammo and weapons would still remain legal even in 1990 because it was bought when it was legal. You'd still be able to resell it. So the, the ammo in Albania had been given to the Albanians in the 70s um, and while it was legal. So we figured, hey, this ammo does not bi- violate the embargo, so it should be allowed under our contract. But our contract specifically says that no Chinese ammo can be delivered, period. So we have a choice. We have to, we could either go to the army and say, hey guys, you know, uh, we have this ammo that doesn't violate the embargo, but it does violate this, the technical terms of our commercial contract. Can you guys give us an exemption? And they could have said, yeah, you know, we wrote, we, sorry about that. We wrote the contract bad. We meant to put in a reference to the embargo, but we didn't. So here's an exemption. Please deliver the ammo. We really need the ammo. Um, or they could have said something along the lines of, we thought at the time, they could have said something along the lines of like, well, you know, the requirement to deliver to, uh, against Chinese was, um, was put out there for all your competitors to bid on. So they couldn't bid this if, your competitors were doing the right thing, they couldn't have bid on this uh, this uh, this ammo because it was Chinese. So it's not fair that you guys get to keep this $300 million contract because you guys had an unfair advantage. And so we're going to take this $300 million contract away from you and put it out for bid on the open market again. And we thought, mm. if we tell them we risk losing a $300 million contract, maybe we shouldn't tell them. And so we hired someone to uh, some Albanian company to repackage the ammunition. So it got rid of all the uh, the uh, Chinese markings on the boxes. And there was like Chinese documents inside the cases. And we repackaged it into these thick cardboard boxes and wrapped in plastic to prevent from corrosion and um, and started delivering that. And the army was thrilled with the ammo. They kept on taking delivery. And um, and, and then Ephraim, what really got us in trouble was that Ephraim was trying to save money on the contract. And so he he, uh, decided to switch packaging companies to change to someone else who was going to save him money. And the guy who was originally doing the repackaging contract for us got stuck with $20,000 worth of cardboard boxes and asked Ephraim to pay him for it. Ephraim said, yeah, 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 I'll pay you for it. But of course he never did because that's just how he rolls. And so he screwed him out of 20 grand. That guy got really mad and went to the New York Times and told them everything we were doing. And he went to the FBI and told them everything we were doing. And so so the US government opened up an investigation. And... um, uh, and uh, at the time, this was like in June of 2007. And then he, uh, he of course, looking to screw everyone over. So he told, and the contract was going well. So he told me that he didn't feel like I was uh, holding up my end of the work. And so he didn't feel like he owed me any money. And so I told him, well, in that case, I'll see you in Cork and go fuck yourself. And so I left the company. Um, and about two months later, there was a, a raid uh, by the federal agents raided his office and um, uh, took all the documents and all his, uh, you know, everything. They found a, a to-do list on his desk that said repackage Chinese ammo in his handwriting. Oh. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and so, yeah. It's like a Fredo and, move. Yeah, for real. And it came out later that they had informed the, the the Justice Department, informed the the U.S. Army that this stuff was all Chinese, and the U.S. Army emailed them back. This is all in emails because it came out in court later. Uh, the U.S. Army emailed the Justice Department saying, "Hey, this this ammo is mission critical, and if you want us to stop taking delivery on it, we need a letter from the Attorney General of the United States requesting that that uh, we stop taking delivery on this." And that letter never came. 
So they kept on taking delivery of the Chinese ammo for another six months after that until the New York Times published their front page article. And that front page article had our uh, mug shots on the front page, Ephraim and my mug shots. Uh, we did not look great. And, um, and it was right next to a picture of rusty looking ammunition, corroded ammunition. And the, the New York Times said that we were just a couple of kids who didn't know we were, what we were doing. They, they found out somehow that we had been, that we smoked weed. So they called us, you know, like our nickname in the media became the stoner arms dealers. And, uh, you know, they, the New York Times portrayed it as like the, the Bush administration is just so incompetent that they give a couple of stoners a $300 million contract and the entire war on terror in Afghanistan is relying on these couple of stoner kids. Wait, wait, you're saying the New you York know? Times would sensationalize a story <laughs> to, to create yeah. a narrative? Come on, I, the, you no know, way. I was actually a fan of the New York Times until they wrote about me. So uh, I know, bet there's that, a lot of people that could say that. Show you. Uh, that's probably true. Yeah. So they implied that all the ammo that we were delivering was rusty and defective. And it just, w it wasn't true that, that the picture of the ammunition that they had on the front page was actually of Bulgarian ammo. It wasn't even the Chinese Albanian stuff that we were delivering. And it was like 30,000 rounds out of like 180 million. So it was a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent that they had inspected and rejected because it was like, you know, the army inspects stuff before they accept it and pay you for it. So they had inspected it. They saw that this stuff was crap because the seals were broken. So there was corrosion that got in there. And so they rejected it. They didn't pay us for it. But because it's Afghanistan, they had nowhere to put the rusty ammo. So they just stuck it to the side of the uh, airport. And when the New York Times came to investigate and they started asking around, you know, can I see some of the ammo that 8 UY has been delivering? Uh, someone pointed them at that stuff that they had rejected because it was the only stuff that hadn't been issued to troops at the time. So it was around for them to inspect. So that was the stuff that they got pictures of. That was the stuff that the reporter saw. And they kind of implied that that was everything that we were delivering was like that. So this created a huge scandal. And almost immediately, within a few days, the army uh, put out a, a statement saying that they had no idea that this was going on and that that uh, that they were taking the contract away from us and or from Ephraim because I I wasn't with the company anymore at this point and um, and uh, then they and then the Justice Department charged us with fraud uh, after six months of doing nothing right because the army needed the ammo but now that that there was a big political stink and everyone was embarrassed because the New York Times suddenly they charged us with fraud and uh, yeah and they claimed that. Uh, uh, Every document that we supplied claiming that this, that the ammo was from Albania was an act of fraud. And we had supplied 71 aircraft loads of this ammo. So that's 71 documents that we had signed that this stuff had originally come from Albania. Uh, and so therefore 71 counts of fraud, each with up to five years in prison. So we could get up to 355 years in prison unless we would plead guilty and then they would combine it into one. And then we can get five ma five years maximum unless, you know, and, and since we pled guilty, uh, they would recommend to the judge that we get on the low end of the, of the sentencing guidelines. So maybe one year, maybe just probation. So that, that was, those were our options. You either get probation by plea guilty or, or you can get 355 years in prison if you fight us in court. Ugh. And you ended up on, under house arrest, right? Yeah. So I pled guilty, obviously, because that was... <laughs> That was yeah. my only option. Uh, right. I, well, even if I wanted to fight them in court, which would have been a bad idea, um, I didn't have the money to fight them in court because Ephraim had stolen all the money from me. He didn't pay me anything that he owed me. And I was working on a commission-only basis and living off my life savings uh, while this was happening. So I didn't really have the option. Um, so I pled guilty. I ended up getting, I, I was obviously scared shitless because I was looking at possibly decades of my life in prison. And so, um, I, uh, I, um, uh, pled guilty and I got sentenced to seven months of house arrest, which I feel extremely lucky and grateful that that was only that. So, David, here's the business takeaway yeah. as I see it. Next time, instead of hiring a repackager, you just hire a good lobbyist. That's what you guys needed. You, I mean, let's be real. You just for needed real. A good, you for just real. needed a good lobbyist, yeah, and that is actually true. <laughs> uh, I, and that's so. Just the so the listener knows the story you just heard. 
you hear about these things called lobbyists right there. They're, that This is yeah. the kind of stuff that they make all these things okay. So, yeah. well, but I do want to ask a true. serious question, man, because you're still an entrepreneur. I want to know what you're working on now at Wardog mm-hmm. University. I want to learn, hear a little bit more about that and just other things mm-hmm. that you've done. But looking back on this harrowing tale, I mean, this crazy mm-hmm. tale that you, that was mm-hmm. so, it was so crazy that it became a blockbuster movie. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Right. I don't think I've done anything yeah. worthy of, of a movie just yet. You know, I still got some time. Uh, <laughs> but what, what are the lessons learned as an entrepreneur and building a business, decisions that you've learned to, that you would make differently next time, kind of mm-hmm. just tell the listener as a mentor and, you know, what would you do differently? And some, just some, just some good lessons learned from all this. Well, I would say that the biggest lesson I learned is that it is so critical about who you work with. Um, because I mean, I told myself at the time, Hey, this guy, Ephraim, he know he knows how to make millions of dollars and I don't. So I'm going to learn, uh, all the business secrets from him. And yes, I have all these warning signs that he's a kind of a sociopath and a scumbag and he seems to screw over everyone that he comes in contact with. But, uh, but I'm his best friend and, you know, like we grew up together and so he wouldn't do that to me. Right. And, uh, and anyway, I'll just put up with him for, you know, a year or two or three and make a whole bunch of money and then I'll retire and, and, uh, and I'll be set. And that was my thinking at the time. And I think it, it was, uh, you know, looking back, it was probably a reasonable thing to think, but, um, I think that you don't realize that destructive people can be really destructive. You know, you think that there could just be a little bit annoying sometimes and you could put up with them and deal with it. But people who are destructive and take massive risks like that uh, and, and are dishonest and, and screw people left and right, they could bring a lot more problems into your life than you are willing to handle. And that is worth the, you know, that is worth the upside. So, you know, I thought, oh, he, he's, he's just like an annoying guy to deal with that I'll, I'll just put up with in order to learn the business and make money. But I didn't realize, hey, this guy could land me in prison for the rest of my life. And if he's, you know, screwing over all his other business partners, why wouldn't he screw me out of all the money? And what makes me think I'm special? So I think that the most important thing is if you don't like the person that you're working with, they're really not worth working with mm-hmm. because, you know, not only because on a, on a day-to-day level, uh, it's just going to make you miserable, right? You know, you work with someone you don't like, it's just a, a miserable experience and, and you're not going to enjoy your work. And if you're not enjoying your work, you're not going to put all you can into it because people don't tend to do things that they don't enjoy. Um, so now, I mean, some people have a higher tolerance for the grind, they call it, right? You know, being able to do things that are difficult and un- and not pleasant. And I definitely was grinding for quite a bit and almost ground myself down to the bone. Um, but uh, But more than just that, I think that, that you don't realize all the potential downsides that can happen as happened to me, right? Because when you are dealing with someone who takes such massive risks, uh, you, that could end you up in legal trouble and legal trouble could truly destroy your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only could it make you go bankrupt because you'll spend all your money defending yourself to keep you out of prison, but in a worst case scenario, I mean, you could spend the rest of your life in prison and no, no, no amount of money is worth that. No amount of money is worth being stuck in a cell for years on end. I would not, you, you know, even if it's not the rest of your real, of your life, I would not take any amount of money to spend five years in prison, right? Because that is something you're never going to get back. Sure. And so, and you know, I had a, I had a little, I had a baby on the way, and I realized I could miss my entire my kid growing up, and I'll never get that back. And she will never get her father back for all those years. And there's really no amount of money that is worth that. So um, that that's the the biggest lesson that I that I took away from that is that it's so critical to to really think long and hard about who you're working with and think about if this is the kind of person that you want to be 
uh, associated with and dealing with day to day? And do you trust this person to make important decisions for you and, you know, and for, for the people around you? Uh, because it's, it's an, an enormous part of your life. Uh, so that, that, that would be the, the biggest thing that, uh, that I took away on a positive aspect. Um, it, it did teach me and I'll, and I say, I'll, I'll give Ephraim, you know, for all the bad things I say about him, right. I'll give him, I give him credit is that he was one of the hardest working people that I ever met. And, and that translated directly into his success, into our success. Um, the more you work, usually not always, but usually the more success you have, right. It, 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 they say the harder you work, the luckier you get. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that a big part of our success was that we were willing to work harder than most of our competitors. And, you know, most of our competitors had normal lives and they worked nine to five and they'd clock out, you know, at the end of the day. And we were just obsessives and we worked, we worked ourselves to the bone and we worked 18 hour days and we, we would go instead of doing, you know, a, a Google search for, for uh, suppliers and stopping at like, you know, the fourth or the fifth page. We'd go 20, 30 pages in and, and, you know, just like literally try to outwork our competitors. And that's a, a huge aspect of success is how much um, work you're willing to put into something. It has a, a very direct uh, uh, effect on whether you succeed or not. And, and so that, that would be the, um, the other major aspect of it. The third major aspect is just on a rather... Um, on a, a more broad sense, uh, uh, not not only is it important to to think about who you're working with, but it's also very important to think about what you're doing and what kind of work you're doing and whether that appeals to you as a person, right? Because for me, I realized that the work itself of government contracting, from for me personally. It wasn't particularly interesting, right? I mean, sure, I loved making money, right? Um, but it, it's really just glorified logistics, right? You know, you are looking for suppliers and um, and logistics, and you're putting it all together, and and you're rolling the dice. There's a lot of, uh, 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 I mean, every business is a roll of the dice, right? Uh, but but when you're bidding on government contracting, you're literally hoping that you have the best deal for the government and they pick you. And if they don't, then all that work you did to get the best price and work out the logistics that all goes to waste. Now, in that kind of business, you could work on 10 deals and only win one. And that one makes you enough money that it's, that it makes all the times that you lost worth it. And it takes a certain kind of person to be able to deal with those kinds of ups and downs in the business. And I realized that I, you know, that, that is a good business and you could make a lot of money and it appeals to certain personality types. Um, and, but for me personally, I wanted to do something else after, I mean, maybe it was because I was burnt out and if I didn't have such a harrowing, uh, emotional, uh, experience, uh, traumatic, I should say experience with the business. Uh, I, I would have a, a better, a better emotional reaction to it, but that's really why I never, uh, got back into it, uh, was because I had such a, uh, such a, uh, uh, traumatic experience doing it. I think that, uh, that I, I just have a, um, emotional, uh, uh, resistance to doing that kind of work now, which is why I shifted into, into other businesses afterwards. There's also, the, of course, the fact that I was legally barred from doing business with the U.S. government for 10 years, so I legally could not do it, even if I wanted to, um, which has expired now. I, I legally can do business again, but, um, but I've already built my current businesses, which uh, I don't know. Yeah, tell me about that. I, I see you know, Singular that, Sound. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, Singular Sound is right behind me. There's a, for the people who are just listening to this, uh, yeah. uh, there's a poster behind me with a a uh, picture of a product called uh, the Beat Buddy, yeah, and um, and uh, Gizmodo called it as there's a big quote on the top, a genius idea, right? Nice. You know, they they said it, not me. <laughs> so what is the I, Beat I did, Buddy? I did put it on a poster, though, um, as you should. So yes, yes. So uh, so the way I I got so it actually started 
uh, fittingly enough, from uh, my time in house arrest. Uh, that's how I got into my next business. I was, uh, as I mentioned before, I was sentenced to seven months of house arrest, uh, which I feel very grateful that it wasn't more than that. Um, I had a, a little ankle tracking monitor on my ankle, you know, as, as you do with house arrest. So I couldn't leave the house. Um, but it wasn't, it's not like a COVID style lockdown. People could visit you. So I'd have my, I, I've always been a musician since I was, uh, since I was like 15. I've been playing guitar, always been a singer since I was a kid. So I'd have my friends come over. A lot of my friends are musicians. We jam, you know, to pass the time. But I really missed playing with the drummer because the drums, uh, give the, the music, the beat, right? You dance mm -hmm. to the beat in music. And so it gives the energy to the music. And, but of course, no drummer is going to pack up his whole drum set and bring it over my house just to jam because that's a huge pain in the butt. And of course, it would wake up all my neighbors. They would not be happy with a, someone playing the drums uh, in my apartment. So I bought a drum machine, which is an electronic device that goes on the table, has a lot of buttons. Each button makes a different drum hit sound and you can pl uh, make beats on it and play mm -hmm. it back in a loop. Uh, so you have a, a beat going and then you can play your guitar to it. But every time I wanted the beat to change, I'd have to stop playing my guitar, press a button on the drum machine, go back to playing my guitar, which interrupted the flow of the music. So I thought I need a drum machine that's in a pedal format that can go on the floor and I could control the beat hands-free while I play my guitar. And I went online to look for it, but nobody made anything like it. So I made it. It's called the Beat Buddy. Like nice. the buddy that plays the beat. And it's the world's first drum machine guitar pedal hybrid and uh, launched my company, Singular Sound, uh, to produce this. And uh, since then, we've come, it, it became a huge success. It, it's uh, won all the major awards. That's also, I have pictures of on the, yeah. on the uh, poster. Not that you can see them that well, but uh, won pretty much every, every major award in the musical products industry, the musical instruments industry. Um, has done very well. A lot of famous musicians have been using it. It's actually one of the one of the coolest experiences of my life. I think, uh, besides the whole War Dogs thing, uh, in my current life, I should say, uh, was that. So I'm a huge. Um, I grew up in the '90s, so mm -hmm. I'm a huge grunge fan. I, Same. I grew, Same. Yeah. I I learned to play guitar. Uh, you know, uh, listening to Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice ah. in Chains. Um, Yes. And the basis, the basis from Allison Chains, his name is Mike Inez. Mm -hmm. He, he, he comes up to me at a trade show. And he, this was like the second year, I think, when we were, uh, had just come out with the Beat Buddy. He comes up to me at a trade show and he, he looks at me. He's like, Hey, you're the guy who came out with the Beat Buddy. And I'm like, Yeah. He's like, Yeah, man. I just bought one two months ago. I've been writing all my new music using it. Oh, <laughs> dude. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. That's and I was so like, So cool. Yeah, I was like, dude, I learned to play guitar listening to your music. Like your songs is how I learned how to play guitar. It just blew my mind. It was the coolest thing. And he loved it so much. He's like, yeah, we're going to be playing in Miami. You know, I'm based in Miami. So he's like, we're going to be playing in Miami in a, uh, this summer. He's like, uh, he gave me his number. He's like, I'll get you backstage. And I got to meet the whole band. It was so, so fucking cool. Yeah. That, is, so cool. that is, that is, you yeah. know, one of the things I hear from that yeah. too, dude, Hey, congratulations. Yeah. That's, that's freaking yeah, thank awesome. You. Thank you. And obviously, you know, we grew up in the same era. So the, the best music era, uh, yeah. as far as I'm, I still remember the first I time agree. my, so I graduated high school in 93. So it was around 92, 93. I hear, um, alive the first time mm -hmm. from, uh, oh, yeah. Pearl Jam. Pearl and then Jam, yeah. that, that whole, the, the whole 10 album is just amazing. Stupid. It's yeah. so good. Every song, one of, one of the best ever, yeah. ever. So, and yeah. then of course, yeah. whenever I discovered, um, Mm -hmm. um, Alice in Chains, Down in a Hole, and all those. Amazing just, song, yeah. Yeah. So, but what I, what I hear too, though, is, mm -hmm. um, dude, you, and that's why I started this conversation the way I did. You're just a serial entrepreneur. You can't go do a nine to five. That would be worse than a house arrest for <laughs> yeah. you. Is that fair to I say? I agree. Absolutely. I would hate to work a nine to five. Yeah. I really would. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, um, so I've got two new business ventures that, that, uh, that I want to talk about before we, before go we for wrap it, brother. up. Uh, so my latest, uh, so, uh, just to say, to, uh, to finish up with the beat buddy. Yeah. So singular sound, which is my music company, uh, that makes the beat buddy. We've also come out with six additional products. We've come out with, uh, a, this is only going to really matter to the musicians in the audience, but, um, uh, we came out with, a uh, uh, MIDI foot controller. So you control other, so you could control the beat buddy and do a lot more stuff with it, like halftime, double time, a lot of other things. 
And we also came out with the world's most advanced looping pedal called the Aeros Loop Studio. It's the world's first looping pedal that uh, has a touch screen on it that you could actually see the music being recorded in waveforms, which makes looping a lot easier. Uh, it also does both sequential and parallel looping at the same time. Only looping artists are going to know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Um, anyway, uh, but the, uh, uh, recently uh, launched a new company with my brother for our first non-musical product, uh, which is called InstaFloss, which is the world's first device that flosses all of your teeth for you in 10 seconds. Oh, wow. So you, yeah, so you can check it out on InstaFloss.com. Uh, we just started delivering the first units to uh, to customers literally two weeks ago. So I'm super excited about it. We've been working. I'm going to look this up right now. Yeah. Keep talking. Yeah, yeah. We've been working on it for five years, so it's been a quite quite a journey. Um, and this is our first product that is meant for the general market. Uh, meaning, uh, I mean, mus- I love musicians. I'm a musician, of course. I am forever grateful f- to the music musician community, but unfortunately, it's it's a, a lot smaller than I would like it to be. Um, and so it's like maybe only like 1% of the population would be uh, uh, interested in buying a Beat Buddy or a advanced looping pedal. Um, but InstaFloss, everybody has teeth, everybody needs to floss, everybody hates flossing. And so uh, we designed, my brother and I, we designed a machine that uses uh, 12 water jets to floss uh, all four quadrants of your mouth at the same time. And so it can floss your entire, uh, teeth, um, uh, in 10 seconds. So Dude, you, see, you know what? Right okay. It's, it's it great. All right, I'm going to buy one and I'm going to tell you why, yeah. if, in case you, you probably noticed I'm 48 years old with freaking braces. My, yeah. my bite is so jacked up that if I want to have teeth when I'm older, then I've got, I had to get braces. So I wear braces for a year. Then I have to get my jaw oh, wow. broken and reset. And then Whoa. I have to run for it. Yeah. And Jeez. And one of the worst parts of, dude, it's horrible. And I put it off for 20 years. I'm like, yeah, I I would really think it'd be cool to be old and have teeth. And so (laughs) so I'm I'm going through it. But this is perfect for people with braces, dude. It is. Holy crap. You need to be rolling up on orthodontists left and right. This is amazing. We are. We are. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have, uh, we're we're in talks with a uh, company that that, uh, supplies dentists and orthodontist offices with equipment and they are going to buy massive amounts of these and and put them in all the offices uh but this is uh but it's primarily a consumer item so this yeah. is uh intended for people to have at home and use uh you know instead of having to use your string floss or or a water pick which is the current water flossing device is much more difficult to use because yep. it's a single jet of water yep. and you have to like aim it That's what your, i'm using right now your, because yeah yeah yeah. So, and the thing with the water pick, the most difficult part about it is getting behind the teeth mm-hmm. and pointing outwards and getting the right angle. Cause you need to be at a 90 degree angle to the gum line. Cause if you point into the gum line, it irritates your gums and makes it inflamed. And if you point away from the gum line, it doesn't do an effective job flossing. So the angle is very important and it's very difficult to do that with a standard water pick. And that's why we designed the Insta Floss because all the angles are perfectly uh, held in place. All you have to do is bite into the device, slide it across your teeth, and it gives you a perfect floss every time. Dude, and you've solved one of those problems that's just like yeah. universally hated. No, no one likes to floss. I've never run into anyone yeah. and said, you know what I can't wait to do is go home and floss tonight. That's just exactly. I freaking love to rip exactly. up some floss. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Exactly yeah, that's, that's actually... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and it just feeds back into what I was saying. <laughs> so you're six years yeah. old in Israel, taking out garbage. Yeah. Then you're selling bed yeah. sheets and linens at senior living facilities. Then you're dealing arms all over the globe. Yeah. And now you're mm-hmm. flossing teeth and solving drummer <laughs> problems. Yeah. Freak it, man. It's, that, yeah. Seriously, that is that is so awesome. I mean, seriously, yeah, David. You. Well done, yeah. dude. And and War Dogs University is coming. And up. War Dogs University, which by yes. the way, I'm excited to hear about that. And I yeah. want to. Uh, that's probably mm-hmm. something. Let's stay in touch on that. And I, I'm, yeah. I've got to get you hooked up with uh, with Altitude. Hopefully, you guys mm-hmm. can connect because he's gonna. He would love you. You're like his. Mm-hmm. He, he actually, I was on his show a while back where he he's he does like every once in a while he'll do a mentoring mm-hmm. show where he like mm-hmm. takes business you know entrepreneurs or whatever and shares mm-hmm. his experiences and he's just that's just his genius 
which by the way, um, any of his books like Choose Yourself, Skip the Line, you mm-hmm. would totally love them. I mean, you've lived it. You're mm-hmm. like me. You live the stuff. So when you read it mm-hmm. by someone like him, it, it just, it really, it's, it hits home. But awesome. I think that it would be one of the best episodes ever to have you on one of his mentoring shows just for you guys to just riff on business and ideas. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm, I'm going to make the pitch for it. And All right. So, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. And what am I going to pay for this? Uh, the, what's it called? The, what was it? The Insta dental? Floss? The Insta Insta floss. Floss. Yeah. What do I pay yeah. for that? So it's a uh, $199. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a yeah. great price point. All right. I agree. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, yeah. this is yeah. okay. So, and so, and where can people keep up with you, learn more about mm-hmm. you, follow up on uh, War Dog You? I want to know about that. Yo, mm-hmm. Where can people keep in touch with you, David? Yeah. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, War Dogs University for people who are interested in learning uh, how to do government contracting uh, is something that I'm currently working on. Hopefully, it'll be uh, launched in the next few months. I don't have an exact timeline on it, but we are. I'm working with uh, with uh, partners who have who were inspired by my story to start their own um, uh, government contracting business, and they've done extremely well. And uh, they were always very grateful for the inspiration, which is why they contacted me and we had the idea to work together and help uh, other people get into the business. So we're, that is something that we are uh, currently working on and hope to launch in the next few months. Um, so people who would like to uh, be informed when that launches, probably the best thing to do is just to follow me on social media. I'll make an announcement. Um, I'm most active on, on Instagram though. I, I'm not like a big social media guy, but, but, uh, but, uh, occasionally I post on Instagram even less occasionally on, on X formerly Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and so, so if you just look for, uh, both platforms, uh, X and, and, um, and, uh, Instagram, uh, you could find me at David Packhouse, just my name, David Packhouse, that's P-A-C-K-O-U-Z. Um, and, uh, that's how you just look up for, for that, uh, handle and you'll find me. Awesome. Well, David, this is a blast, man. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for giving us the story behind the movie and the behind the story. And then just my pleasure, just your, your fascinating life, dude. I mean, it, it's great. And Thank I wish you. you all the best of luck. I hope we stay in touch, man. You know, um, I love, I love having these stories, anything I can do to support you and your entrepreneurial endeavors, brother, I'm here for it. So just stay in touch. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. All right, brother. I appreciate it. All right. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. It means more to me than you can possibly imagine. And if you enjoyed it, please consider going out to Apple and leaving us a five-star rating. That would mean the world to me. Also, follow me on Insta at Jason right now. And don't forget download the Vitruvian Lab app. I mean it. I want to be your personal peak performance trainer. I want to help you improve always and always. Lastly, check out my newsletter, the Vitruvian Letter. You can subscribe at jasonrightnow.com. And until we meet again, please continue to endeavor to improve always in always. I'm out.